All right, uh, I think we're connected. Uh, start letting uh, letting folks in in the room right now. Uh, welcome to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. Uh, my name is Chris, uh, I'm the events coordinator. And uh, tonight we're very happy to be hosting the launch of The Night Always Comes uh, by Willy Vaughn. Be in conversation with Franz Nicolet. You can buy signed copies of the book at powerhousebookstores.com. Uh, the link is in the event page and I'll post it in the chat as well. Uh, if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and the panelists will take, or panelists, the uh, Franz and Willy will take your questions at the end of the event. Uh, and I'll, I'll introduce them now. Uh, Franz uh, Nicolet is a musician and writer living in California's East Bay. Uh, in addition to records under his own name, he has been a member of bands, including The Hold Steady and World Inferno Friendship Society. Uh, his first book, uh, The Humorless Ladies of Border Control, was named a season's best travel book by the New York Times. Uh, and his novel, Someone Should Pay for Your Pain, will be published in August. Uh, Willie Vaughn is the author of the novels The Motel Life, Northline, Lean on Pete, The Free and Don't Skip Out on Me, of which The Motel Life and Lean on Pete have both been made into major motion pictures. Uh, he is the founding members of the bands Richmond Fontaine and the D Lions. He lives outside Portland, Oregon. I'll hand it over now. Well, welcome everybody. And uh, thanks to Chris for putting this together. Um, please do put your questions in the, in the chat or the appropriate place as we go. Uh, I'm sure all of you will have better questions uh, than I do, and I'm, <laughs> I'll be eager to hand it over. Um, I first heard of Willie Vlauten uh, when we shared a label in the UK, and everywhere I went, people would ask me if I, if I knew Richmond Fontaine or if I'd read Willie's books, and eventually I thought, geez, I, I got to check this guy out. And then um, when my publishers heard I was doing this, they just about swooned. They said Willie was one of their models when they started their imprint. So, um, in all these fronts, it's a, it's a treat to, to finally meet you and get to talk to you um, and, 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 and talk to you about your, your wonderful new novel. Oh uh, man, I've, I've been, uh, you know, I think I, we were saying earlier, I think I saw you and I, I remember where I saw you, which was at, uh, it was a festival in England uh, uh, with a whole steady. And I, I've almost met you a handful of times uh, and, and we've had the same manager, but, uh, so it's really nice to actually see you and, and meet you for real. And Chris told me to say hello. And, uh, uh, so this is great. So, uh, it's great to see you. And, um, and I'm just, your, uh, people just sent me, uh, so much you pay for your pain and I'm three quarters of the way through it. I was reading it all last night until my wife got pissed at me for having that light on. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, let's talk about let's talk about your book. Um, I wanted to ask about sort of something personal about you that you put in that you put in the in the dedication and the acknowledgments. You were talking about your work as a house painter. Um, and I'm curious, like, how, why that aspect of your life is both important to you and and to the book. Well, I mean, um, I guess first, you know, I, I was raised to believe if, if you bought, if you could buy, if you bought a house, if you owned your own house, my mother always said, then you, you weren't a failure in life. You, you had made something of yourself. She really believed in, in that aspect of the, of the Amer American dream because she said, look, if you own your own house, then maybe you're not gonna be destitute when you're old. Um, you're not gonna, you can paint your house the way you want to. You can uh, make it look the way you want. You can play your music loud. In, until curfew, you can you can have three cars in your front lawn, or you can have a pristine front lawn. You could put a pool in the back of your house if you want, or or you can put an extra car, or have your cousin live in a trailer in the backyard, and no one's going to get really pissed at you. So you have equity, you have power, uh, and so when I was in when I moved to Portland, I you know I was a, a failed musician in. Uh, in Reno where I grew up and so I moved to Portland and um, you know I was pushing 30 and um, I yeah I was a house painter for years and, and I, I really wanted to own a house and I'd saved for years for a house but I had no confidence in myself and um, and, and uh, the guy I'm in a band with Sean Oldham he's always the smartest guy you know I've known and I took him by this kind of derelict mother-in-law house that was this yeah, uninhabitable at the time, and but it was for sale. 
and I, and I said, I wanted to buy it. You know, that was my dream house. And, and he, uh, he said, you should try. And, you know, this is before the crash in 2008. And, uh, um, and it was really hard to get a loan. Even it was a $70,000 house and I had $20,000 down and I could still barely get a loan. And I was a full-time house painter, you know? Um, so for me, when I owned a house, I just, I, that monkey on my back was gone. I've, I liked myself better because I thought, man, I'm not a bum. I have a little power now. Now I can I can do what I want in my house and not be scared. My landlord's going to kick me out, and I, and I think I started thinking about that in terms of so many cities in the West, in particular where I live, Portland, uh, where housing prices have quadrupled, uh, and and wages have only gone up twice. So a working class guy, a house painter, uh, could never buy a a, a, an, a rundown. 480 square foot house in Portland anymore. It's just, it's, it's, it can't happen. And so I, the book really kind of started from that, the, the rapid change and gentrification of Portland and the idea that a working class guy couldn't buy a house there anymore. Yeah. And that energy is very, certainly very pre present in that book that real estate is an organizing principle in a lot of ways for these characters lives, not just, not just the protagonist, uh, Lynette, but but almost everyone she talks to has something to say about their, their living situation. Well, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it, you know, l l the main character, Lynette, um, she gets, they get a chance to buy the rental. Her mother and her developmentally, developmentally disabled brother have lived in there for 30 years and they get a chance to, to buy it. And it's a, you know, it's a rundown house next to a freeway. Um, but they, but Lynette sees it as their only option for being able to stay in the neighborhood, for them to have power, uh, for the, for their, you know, mortgage to stay the same, and 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 so if they rent, it's just going to go up and up. So yeah, it's it's her obsessing about this one idea of of that side of an American dream, and if if she can attain it, and and she begins to panic when it when it when it doesn't feel like it's going to happen, she begins to panic. And in and, and that way, the, the novel kind of has a noir heart. It becomes a, a, a novel of desperation. And as everybody knows, no one makes good decisions when you're desperate. <laughs> At least I, I've never been one to make good decisions when I'm desperate. Yes, it's, I mean, it's certainly a very fast paced novel. I, I, I started to think it was, it, it was, I was started to wonder when she was going to get some sleep. You know, it's yeah. set up a 48 yeah. hour period in which she's racing all over town. Did you did you have to write out a timeline and, and sort of work on driving times to make it all work out? You know, later on, I did. I did because it was so intense. But but I but I, I was thinking about it in terms of when, when you're stuck, like it, when the world's passing you by. I think I, with her, I was interested in that idea of uh, like the modern economy passing you by and you can't catch up. And you start getting scared um, when life's passing you by or, or you're not prepared for something. You just start getting more panicky and more frightened. And, and, and you, when you see rapid change, you tend to start that whole, like I said earlier, uh, desperation and panic. And so everything seems accelerated. And so you get real jumpy. Um, and so I made it literally like that. So when, when the reader went into it, it feels like that kind of panic you have when you, when your life stalled and everybody else's life is moving past you. Um, I, I wanted the whole novel to be like live inside that, that feel, if that makes sense. Yeah. And if speaking of stalling, one of the running gags is how many times it takes her to attempts. It takes her to start her car each time she tries to get going. Yeah. I mean, I was interested in that, that, that idea too, of like, you know, when, when you're just kind of uh, scraping by, when you're driving a car that you have to either push start sometimes or, you know, the starter's going out and, and it takes you a bunch of times to get it started. Um, and then you, it's like when you're in that situation and then, then the economy really changes and you're still just trying to get your car to start and all of a sudden everyone around you's uh, making more money or making wheeling and dealing or the houses next to you are getting torn down and, and, and little McMansions are going up in their place, and you're like, "Hey, but I'm still, I'm still just trying to keep my car going." Uh, how, you know, I, I was interested in that idea. Like, you take a, a family that's uh, 
really just kind of scraping by and and hanging on by a thread and then you put them in a, an economy that's in a, in a housing situation that's rapidly changing and and that's that's why i had the world set like that right yeah it becomes a class marker right and and as a signal of the very slight hint at a, at a happy ending towards the end right is when she gets a she gets gifted a used car that starts on the first try and you're like ah everything's gonna be Maybe if not everything's going to be okay, at least this her car is going to start. And I think, yeah, exactly. In the in the beginning of the what kind of starts the whole book, and I don't think it's much to give away, is uh, when her mother decides to 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 buy a brand new car uh, instead of believing in buying the house. I think you know a lot of people. I think that I've known in my life, and myself included, to a degree think if you could just buy something that makes you feel better, you know, like something that makes you seem like you're successful. It takes the sting out of not being successful. And, and in, a way, in that way, the mom's shooting herself in the foot uh, and shooting her family in the foot. Um, but I think her mom's so tired uh, that instead of thinking about the future, she's like, man, I've been driving crappy cars my whole life. And I just want to feel like I'm somebody in a nice car before I die. And, right. uh, <laughs> Car, the car and the house are the two sort of grand material uh, signifiers of the of of having achieved something as an adult, right? Yeah, they yeah they always say that, right? The, that uh, there's like the the neighborhoods that where the cars are a lot nicer uh, than the houses, and then and then but they're both status symbols in a way. But I but I think at least from my era and my generation owning a house, and from where I grew up uh, owning a house was the the separating marker if you were a failure or a success in life at least at least from my mom you know do you still own that first house oh yeah man i i i hung on, i hung on to it for that very reason it sounds stupid but i played i was in a band with a guy named paul brainerd in richmond fontaine for well, i don't know 20 years and he and i he and i broke into that house after i bought it but i still had to wait to get the keys but we we went in there we broke in a couple of days before and just sat there and, and drank tequila. And I said, man, this, and this house was like 480 square feet. And, uh, and we just sat there and I was so proud of myself, man. Probably the first time I was ever really liked myself was because of that. <laughs> and you would laugh if you, if you saw the place, you'd think I was nuts, but, but, but shit, I am kind of nuts, but, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I was thinking about this book uh, in comparison to, to your first couple books, um, Northline and Motel Life. Those two books had the protagonists have this sort of coping mechanism of escaping into a fantasy life, right? The Frank in Northline tells these stories and Allison in Motel Life uses uh, Paul Newman as kind of an imaginary friend. Um, Lynette doesn't really have time for that sort of thing. Man, that's really nice that you would even had read those. That makes my makes my day that you even mentioned those. So thank you. Uh, you know, I live most of my life escaping like that. Uh, it was a it was a trick I used ever since I was a kid. Uh, it's a it's a bad. Willie, I don't know if you can hear me. I lost your I lost your audio. I do that anymore in my real life, real life. And so Lynette doesn't do that. So <laughs> I'm sorry to say I lost your audio for much of that answer. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, shit. I don't know if everybody did. Uh, well, well, we can move on then. I'll, well, I'll I just the only thing I would add to that is thank you for reading those early books. And uh, I really appreciate it, and it means a lot to me. Um, another thing about the, the 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 books of yours that I've read, there, a couple times you're I'm just a detail thing, but you casually mention the the um, the elements of Basque culture in the West. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about your interest in the Basque influence in that part of the country. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's a there's a book by. R Robert Laxalt called Sweet Promised Land. He was a, a Nevada Basque, uh, Basque American first generation. And he was one of the only writers I knew growing up bef before the internet. I didn't know any writers out of Nevada except two. 
a guy named Walter Van Tilburg Clark, who wrote Oxbow Incident, and um, and Robert Laxalt, uh, who wrote a bunch of books, but Sweet Promised Land is the one most people know. And so I w was always in awe of him, and I loved all his books. And Reno had a lot of Basque culture. Uh, there's a lot of Basque restaurants in, in Reno, and my mom was obsessed with them when I was a kid. Our only vacations really were to, you know, places like Winnemucca and Elko and Gardnerville and Carson City just to eat Basque food. So my books uh, are always a nod and thanks to Robert Laxalt for being an inspiration and and being a, a, a writer from Nevada, because I didn't know there was, you could be a writer and be from Nevada. So I've always liked Basque uh, <laughs> restaurants anyway. I didn't know that much about the culture, but I, Jesus, I sure loved his books. Yeah, there's a, my wife is friends with a poet from Montana, uh, David Romfed, who's who's really interested in the Basque heritage there and picked up the accordion. And then I picked up this book called The Accordionist's Son that's on Gray Wolf that's also a Basque novel back and forth between the West and, and, and Spain. And it's like, once you start noticing it, <laughs> you notice it in all kinds of places. Yeah. Like when I was a kid, there was a, there was a lot more Basque influence. It felt like Reno was a much smaller town, but it felt like, a, um, more of a, like, you know, it was 60, 70,000, I think when I was a little kid. Um, and so the Basque influence was, was bigger and, and more present, I think, uh, but yeah, you should check out those Laxalt books. They're they're beautiful, and the the University of Nevada Press uh, puts out just gorgeous editions of them. Um, so yeah, he was a real real hero. And in my book, don't skip out on me. I, I, I mentally, he was a big hero of that book. Um, speaking of other writers, you've you've talked about the experience of reading people like Bukowski and Carver when you were forming your sensibility. Now that you're deeper into your career. Um, are there writers or books with which you feel like you're in conversation or you feel like our fellow travelers? I mean, probably there's two, and I, I always mention them and I'm embarrassed by it, but, but you know, it's like your favorite things are your favorite things. Uh, uh, Iron Weed by William Kennedy to me is a perfect novel. And it's a novel that's brought me, uh, it's like a friend of mine. Uh, uh, I can't say enough great things about it. Uh, William Kennedy is is a uh, is a genius with language, and and obviously I'm not, uh, but but he is, and then but he's got he's got a the heart a heart that I understand. So, you know, uh, his his story about Francis Phelan is is breathtaking to me and perfect. Another one that I always go back to is is Fat City by Leonard Gardner. Um, I just love that novel, and it, both of those are are about men who have who have really blown the chances in life that life has given them and but they they haven't given up i mean no one can really give up i guess uh unless you really give up uh but they just kind of they kind of just scrape by and and i've always gotten great comfort from stories where where people are just scraping by because well hell i felt like that most of my life and and i've always read for comfort and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always uh, gravitate towards novels where somebody's beat up and just kind of limping by. Yeah, your, your characters do spend a lot of time getting beat up in various ways. Yeah, it brings me, you know, whatever it says about me, man. But I, uh, but I, 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 I find great comfort in, in novels where, where people are kind of on the ropes. And, and they don't give up. It just kind of eases my mind. And uh, I mean, that's it's fucked up, but uh, you know, that's just maybe why I love novels so much. But, you know, Iron Weed, there, there probably isn't a week that doesn't go by where I don't think about Francis and his life uh, with Helen. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I just love it. Well, this was one of my questions is like, do you ever do you go through periods of, obviously you're, you, you know, you're making the things happen to your characters. Do you, but they, you know, as as you're writing a novel, the character does take on a kind of independent existence within your head. Do you do you go through phases of feeling sorry for your characters or feeling pity for them? I think I, I've thought a lot about it because I don't, you know, when I'm writing them, I don't think about it uh, at all. Uh, I, I think I've always written uh, where I 
I try to analyze something that really scares me, like freaks me out completely, uh, or, or some kind of dent in me that I can't ever get out of me, some kind of scar in me that I can't get out of me. And I try to write about it in hopes that it'll go away. Uh, and so when I write about Lynette or, or Allison Johnson, uh, or characters like Horace Hopper, I put them in a lot of difficult situations, but I, I, I feel like I, by being with them in that situation, it takes out the anxiety of my own life. And, and I'm in the, you know, there's an idea of being scared of something. And then when you're in it, you're not scared because it's happening. Uh, I think I live in that and it takes away my own pain. And then at the same time, I can hold their hand while they're going through it. And um, it's a strange thing, I admit. Uh, but it seems to help. It does, I don't know if it, <laughs> shit, it has made me sane or that's for sure. But, but it brings me, it brings me peace when I'm in the world and I, and shit. And I also want to always write about people that are struggling the way I'm struggling in my head, because if I write a book about someone struggling like Lynette or Horace Hopper, someone that's struggling might find comfort in it. Um, it's like you write a sad song. If you're a sad person, you write a sad song. Then somebody driving down the road will hear that song, and 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 they won't they they won't feel so alone. So I think I think it's a mixture of all that sort of stuff. I love this idea of of you holding, reaching down, and holding the hand of your character. That instead of being like the 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 perverse god that's making terrible things happen to them, you can be a kind of a guardian angel. I think of it that way, or or like. You know, you can make it, you know, I've been in that situation too. Uh, you can make it, um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, uh, when I wrote, the hardest book I ever wrote was uh, Don't, Don't Skip Out On Me, uh, my last book, uh, because I liked that kid so much, man. I really, really liked him. And just saying his name even now breaks my heart. Uh, so it's really interesting why I choose the stories I choose to to write and, and why I would make them so sad uh, so often. Um, but, but they do bring me comfort and I, f I feel like they're little saints that, that live with me. This is kind of a broad question, um, but it popped into my head when I was reading your book. Since your characters are often suff suffused and overwhelmed even by shame and regrets and, and memories of things they wish they had done differently, um, you know, you know, especially to read it now in a world in which shamelessness can seem like a, a novel superpower for some public figures. Um, I guess, I guess the question is why was why does it matter to feel bad about anything if you can't change those things that that have happened? Jeez, that's a good. Uh, that's a heavy I, I question. Know, it's like that. <laughs> no, it's. I mean, I, I'm a failed Catholic. I guess I just grew up in that, dipped in that kind of. Catholic guilt. Um, I've always been run by guilt. You know, my my mom ran us with guilt, and and guilt to <laughs> to degree can get you up every morning, and it can keep you from fucking up too much. Um, it's dangerous. Uh, I don't. That's an interesting idea. I don't know why you should feel bad about anything, uh, but I feel bad about everything a lot of the time, and it's it's a. It's just something I was kind of brought up to, to, to feel like if I fucked up at all, I felt really guilty about it. But maybe you can just mark that up as a, even though we didn't go to church, the, you know, Catholicism just is, is stuck in me in a, in a deep, in, in, inside my bones, you know. That, yeah, right. That's a very Catholic idea, right? That you're, you're, the one, you're the one watching over your own shoulder, keeping you on the straight and narrow. And, you know, like anything you do bad, you should feel horrible about yourself for it and you should punish yourself. I mean, really, uh, the Catholic Church is, is so fucked up on so many levels, but the only thing they ever had good that I've never been able to, to, to deal with, besides they're okay with alcoholism, is, uh, is the idea of, the, of you know, confession. Uh, even if I confess my sins, man, I still fucking feel horrible about the, the bad shit I've done in my life. And, uh, and no amount of uh, confessing ever seems to take that away. Do you have an opinion on Graham Greene? 
with, while we're on Catholicism. I love Graham Greene. You know, I, I go in, in and out of phases with Graham Greene. Um, uh, the Quiet American is really great, but I just tried to read, uh, oh, and I loved End of, of the Affair, um, and Our Man in Havana. I'm trying to think of the one. I just tried to read one set in uh, South America, and I couldn't get into it. It just depends what what mood I'm in. Like Brighton Rock, I really liked, but uh, it just depends what uh, mood I'm in. What about you? You like him? I went through a real period. I mean, because especially when I was on the road, there's a he. You know, he gives you a mood that you can't get from anybody else. And if you want that mood, you got to go to Graham Greene. And there's so many of his books that most of them are available at any used bookstore that you walk into. That's so true, I man. Wander around a weird city that I didn't know, and I could find, you know, Graham Greene and Elmore Leonard, which are both the same. Like, if you want a good, if you want that thing, you know. Well, like you said, like even in foreign countries, there'll always be a, an English Graham Greene. Yeah. So, did you read a lot on the road? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. that, I would take my per diems and spend them all on that, basically. You know, every time I would come through Portland, I would make sure after sound check, roll down to Powell's and spend 150 bucks. And, you know, I, I would bring a, a, a sack of books on the road for sure. Man, my favorite thing was always uh, in the early days of touring back. <laughs> well, I used to just plow through books, man. I could read like, you know, a book every two days on the road. And, and I loved it. But now they lately in the last shit last 10 years maybe even they've started calling me narky because i fucking am a, i'm a narcoleptic in, in the van i just sleep all day and i'm so mad because i want to read like i have my stack of books and i'm so excited because it's like the only time i can read during the day where i don't feel guilty for reading during the day and uh and i'm you know you're stuck in a van and you're i'm so excited to read and the yeah i'm on like page three and i'm like damn <laughs> So yeah, that's why my band calls me narky. Yeah, my thing was, I don't like to, I like to read a book and then keep it. Even if I don't, yeah. read it, if I never read it again, I can look at it on the shelf and something from that book or some of the feeling of reading it, I can get that just by looking at it. Or if I get rid of the book, that feeling is, is disappeared. But if you read quickly and you're on the road for a while, eventually, you know, you're filling up valuable space <laughs> with these, with these hardcovers. Or you're mail, or you're spending all your money you make on the road, mailing them back home. <laughs> mailing them home, absolutely. Um, so, a couple, I'm seeing some appreciation in the chat for for Allison Johnson, uh, your character from um, uh, Motel Life, uh, Northline from Northline. Mm -hmm. um, you've written a female protagonist a couple times now. Are there substantive substantive ways you approach that differently? Um. You know, I really don't think about it too much. You know, I, I've always had the same philosophy about whether or not I, I do it well or whatever. I have no idea. But I always think about all my women characters. My cousin used to be a, a drinking buddy of mine. And, and she's like an old pal of mine. And I just think of every woman I write about is her. It's just like, a, you know, like... In most cases, if I like, you know, if I like the woman, like Lynette, when I write Lynette, I think she's my cousin. When I write Allison Johnson, I think of her as my cousin and my friend. Uh, I never think about them. And then I forget there's what sex they are and just think about them as people. Um, uh, so I never, I never, I always just think of them as friends of mine. Um, and the only other thing is, I, you know, I was raised by a woman and all the best people in my life or most present, I guess, or gentlest or cared about me the most were women. So, uh, you know, I've always written about women and shit, I write songs for a woman, uh, uh, but I don't, I never really think about it too much, really. One of the things that struck me about Lynette is, you know, despite all the terrible things that are happening to her and um, she doesn't, um, you know, she, she never feels like a victim. And even when she starts to uh, like fall into that, asserting that she's a victim in some way, uh, people like JJ and her mother always push back against that idea. Yeah, I mean, I never thought of her. I mean, I guess she's a victim of, of her childhood. Uh, you know, I think Lynette grew up as a, basically a servant to her mother and a, and a, and a babysitter to her brother. Um, 
I, I don't think she ever got to be a kid, uh, especially after her grandparents die. I don't think she ever got to be a kid. And she's just kind of been on this train of, of taking care of, of uh, other people. And, and when you take care of it, when you put other people in, in front of yourself or you don't take care of yourself mentally or physically, you either, in my experience, you either implode or explode. Um, you know, you do both, but some people tend to implode more than explode. And I was interested in, in a person that explodes when they're powerless. And I've always been interested in people that don't have power. Um, and, I, and I think with Lynette, she's not a victim. She's tough as shit. Uh, but, but she dips her toes into a dark world uh, when you meet the, when you meet the, the story. And, and it is a, it's a story that is dipped in noir and the fact that the, the, the novel is about greed. You know, it's about what happens when, when, when greed overcomes community, when personal greed, you know, I was interested from the, the quote by President Trump, which was the point, you can't, yeah, the point is you can't be too greedy. Now he, he was speaking, I think, in, about business deals, but it made me think that so much of the U.S. is, is based on that idea um, that it, I got to get what's mine and it's all about me. And, and, and so in anger, I wrote, okay, if you, if you think that's a good option, then this is how it looks at the bottom. If, if you think greed is good, this is how it, this is how it looks when Lynette, who's, who believes in community and is trying to save her family, his way of life, uh, and she has to go against all these guys that just believe in, I'm going to just take what I need. It's all about what I need. And um, so that was kind of the whole battle of the novel. Um, without giving too much about uh, way too much about how the how the book concludes, speaking of people getting what they want, um, it does seem like a slightly uh, more of a sunrise at the end than some of your other books. You know, everyone gets, if not exactly what they wanted, um, something like it. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's it, it, it's a tough road for somebody. Uh, like Lynette, I think that's been so codependent her whole life and really just like a, a pack horse her whole life. Um, and I, you know, I think she, I think she's, she'll be okay, but man, it's gonna, I think it's gonna be really rough on her, uh, but I think she's tough enough to deal with it, but it's hard to be, to be, uh, have a lot of dents in you and grow old unless you got to work hard to kind of bang out the dance as much as you can so you can be a good person. And I think, I think she's tough enough to do it, but man, she was, she was dealt a few bad hands and she, she hadn't handled some of her moves the best. Um, but, uh, but, but she's tough. I love that. Hanging out the dance. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go into the chat here and pull out some of the audience questions. Man, you're sure um, a nice guy. <laughs> um, David, who I believe is from Scotland, is is wondering if how you feel about the film adaptations of your novels. I mean, I I really enjoyed them both. I mean, the the one I, the thing I liked about the Motel Life so much um, was the the animation and and that they shot it in in Reno at a time when all my favorite places that were in the book were still open. And so they shot majority of the movie and the actual places I wrote about. And I got to say that it made me feel good. It was the first time I ever went back to Reno and, and felt anything but kind of a bum. Uh, so that experience was great. Um, and I, I got to meet Chris Christopherson, which was amazing. Um, and he was cool to me. Uh, um, and then Lean on P was just a pleasure. A Andrew Haig, the director, is uh, is just one of my favorite people. He's just a straight up gentleman. And, uh, and they shot in Oregon and they got Portland Meadows, the horse track that's no longer here. Uh, they got Portland Meadows to sign off on filming it there. So I feel really lucky is, is like markers in, the, in, in my life to get to see these places that are so often torn down. Uh, both, both really depict uh, that time and era. So I, I had a, 
I had a great time, got some free meals out of it, and, you know, got to stay in a couple of fancy hotels and uh, got this Yeti mug from something I went to. So life ain't so bad. Um, when you go back to Reno, do you feel like you recognize it or do you feel like it's you're writing about a Reno uh, that no longer exists? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Reno was always my favorite place. Uh, I hated moving there. I just was a failure there as a musician. So I had to move. Um, uh, but I uh, always wanted to move back. Um, but, but, but Reno, it, like Portland, has changed and growing and really expensive to live. Um, and that its time as a casino town is over. Uh, it was a casino city uh, and it's no longer really one to that degree like Las Vegas. It couldn't, it couldn't be Las Vegas. And now with so many Indian casinos, it's it's just becoming a different place, and uh, it's not the place uh, that I understood and and have known. But you know, it's a great city that's that's just too big for me. But uh, but man, I'll move back there someday. I hope. You think so? I hope so, man. <laughs> I mean, there's a certain area of town I've always wanted to live in, and I at the crash in 2008, uh, I tried to buy a house in the area I wanted because the housing prices were so. Uh, low, but as you know, being a musician, man, it's really hard to get a loan, and uh, and I just I couldn't quite swing it. So, mm -hmm. um, Chris wants to know what uh, something about the process of organizing your ideas for books. Do you have more than one uh, a, more than one stream going on at once, or do you have a pool of ideas that coalesce, or how do you how do you approach when you start a new book? I mean, generally. Uh, um, Generally, I, I could tell you, there'll be like, I'll have like bigger ideas that, that kind of stew around in me for a long time. And then I kind of know that there'll be the next novel. And then generally I could tell you over a cup of coffee, the, the basic idea of the novel. So I can tell you like all the big things that happen. Um, I, I, that's kind of the way I work. Um, I don't have a ton of ideas drifting around. I have like four or five that I think are, that are serious like contenders for for a novel because a novel as you know they take a, a long time and so you got to pick wisely um uh so yeah how about you how do you how do you know well yeah that's a good question i mean my line on pe people i'm sure you get this question about you know how is it different writing writing lyrics from writing books and you know the big difference is is how long it takes and how much feedback from outsiders you can get during that time right like not that you write a song every time in an afternoon, but you can reasonably expect it to happen from time to time. And, and, uh, and then you can go out and play it that night if you want to and see if it goes over. Um, not, uh, you know, when writing a book, you're talking, you know, at least a year, year and a half, couple of years before, before you're often even willing to show it to anybody. And, and, and that's a lot of time where you don't, you're not necessarily sure if what you're working on is any good. Yeah. Well said, man. I've, I feel, I mean, the only thing I, I find comfort in is I, I love disappearing. And maybe that's why some of my novels were set in Reno because I really wanted to live in Reno. Uh, I always wanted to steal a beat up horse from the horse track. Well, actually I, I own one now, but, but I wanted to be the kind of guy that would do that. And I know I never would be. Um, and I always wanted to live on a, a sheep ranch in the middle of Nevada. And I always wanted to be a boxer, even though I fucking hate violence. Uh, but I wanted to be the kind of guy that was could, could get up in the morning and run five miles and do all that shit. So a lot of times they're just, it's just a, it's a dream world and a, a fucked up dream world that I can disappear into. And I guess that's the comfort level where, I, where if I do spend two years on a project that doesn't go anywhere, I don't feel that bad because 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 I got to be somewhere else. Mm, that's interesting. Tell me about the horse. You have a horse? My horse, I have three, I have three horses. I got an old Portland Meadows race horse. We call him Dash. His name was a meritable Dash. He's a grandson of the, the famous Dash for Cash quarter horse. He raced three times. He won once in a fair. He, lied, he got third twice in, uh, at Portland Meadows, and then then he kind of languished in shitty situation after shitty situation, and and then then we picked him up, and and my wife's the real horse person, and she she got him to be a little lamb, you know, she got him really sweet, but man, it took her a lot of work. He was a pretty beat up, uh, angry guy when we got him. 
do you need uh how much how much how much land do you need to have for three horses you mean more than we have we have four four acres but we, we're butted up against thousands of acres of logging land that we can ride on and do all that stuff but uh but it's it's tough having horses in the northwest because it just rains so much so um but yeah yeah we have we have him and then we have a, a like a kick-ass cowboy horse uh, that my wife rides who's just a genius horse and then we have kind of like the angry little brother of those guys and uh you know and i'll send him over to your house as soon as we hang up you can have him <laughs> um the fantastically named joe coyote uh is curious oh, wow. um you know it, it since your since your novels are so um based in these localities that you know pr very well would you consider ever writing a novel uh set, that's set overseas or with characters going overseas Man, I don't know if I'd have the confidence. I mean, maybe I'm not the right guy. There's a ton of stories I wish I could tell or I wish I had the confidence to tell. Um, but, but I don't don't see it at this point. Maybe I'll get lucky and get to move to Spain or I'll, I'll buy a place in Galway, Ireland, which I would love uh, and I'll write there. But most, you know, I love writing about the West just because I'm, I'm in love with it. And I think it's really fun and beautiful. And there's so many stories I'm interested in here. Um, but, and, and I love disappearing in those locations, but, so I don't really see it. I, I, I think as I get older and the way the world is, I get scared or, you know, I'd get scared <laughs> to write a story set in Spain or somewhere. Cause what the fuck do I know about that area? What about you? Do you feel like scared of writing about places or are you like, are, are you, do you have Graham Greene in you? I mean, I have the traveling gene, that's for sure. I mean, both of my books have been about traveling and to some yeah. degree, um, you know, you, if you're writing that sort of thing, you, you're always running up against the travel writer danger, um, which is that, um, which is that you're going to, you're just dipping in and dipping out and try and forming an opinion and broadcasting your opinion based on dipping in and dipping out. Yeah. And, um, you know, you can't escape that. Uh, and you, you just have to, I, I don't know. The best the best thing that I could come up with is like this is, you know, when you're reading good travel writing, it's because you you're interested in the sensibility of of the person's reacting to an unfamiliar location. And so, you know, if you can frame your reaction in that context and people can read it in that context as, you know, this is someone's brief um brief impression and you, you know, take it with that grain of salt. Um that's the best thing. Before we go, man, will you tell everybody about your, your novel? Because uh, I know it doesn't come out till, well, on my thing it said June, but it's coming out in August? Yeah, they switched up the distributor so that kicked it back a couple months. Yeah, Someone Should Pay for Your Pain is, a, is about a, a, a traveling musician. It's a kind of, uh, about the, the kind of character that I was afraid I might have turned into if I didn't, if I didn't, you know, change up my life a little bit. You know, you, you, you come up, you, you, you take on these ideas of the kind of traveling musician you want to be as a young person. And sometimes those ideas, if you stick with them too long, you feel like you're walking with a crowd of people and then you turn around and you're the only one still walking. Right. Uh, and that's a very, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a dangerous place to be. Um, so, um, yeah, my guy is, um, you know, he's, he's, he's not as successful as he wanted to be. Um, he's, he's, he's made some, some wrong, wrong choices. Um, and then he's, uh, he's got this niece who's still in that idealistic period about the kind of life that he has and, you know, what really admires him and wants his life. And she wants to come on the road with him and then they have to, they have to hash it out. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great portrayal of life on the road is, a struggling like successful enough to keep going but just barely musician i mean i love i love that aspect of it and I mean, you, you can make a decent living making a couple hundred bucks a night if you're you know if you only spend 35 bucks on gas and you know if you spend 50 bucks and make 100 you're still you're still come that's a pretty good margin but it's pretty exhausting yeah and you hope you you got you don't have to see your your quality of home stage you hope that your fans you know are like uh upper middle class and uh have a jacuzzi and not you're not staying at like the the bartender's basement that you have to share with like his little brother 
Yes. <laughs> I mean, you could get, you, you, you just have to embrace the uncertainty. And the, I mean, that's what I, that's what I liked about it when I was doing that kind of work is, is, is okay. I'm rolling into this town, you know, whether it's, whether it's in Indiana or in Bulgaria and like, who's going to be the guy that meets me and what's, what's his story. And, you know, who's going to be the weirdo who wants to, wants to talk and what's their story. And, you know, that's yeah. stuff is really interesting. If you, once you start taking notes about it. I mean, I was, I love, I never liked doing that by myself. Uh, like I know I don't have the confidence level to, to be in a band by myself uh, or be a solo guy, but man, I love the camaraderie of, being in a, like a cog in a band and, and, and being on these adventures. I, I always liked that a lot. And I still like that. Um, but man, I could well, be touring by myself always ran me down. Uh, I couldn't do it. I think for me, it was a, it, the idea was that it was a challenge as a performer. Yeah. When you're in a, up on stage with a bunch of people. And especially if you, if you make a lot of noise that, um, that that in itself has a power over the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if you have a uh, that can make up for a lot, and even if the crowd, even if there's not that many people there, at least you have your your buddies with you, and you. Oh can, yeah, man, I love uh, that. But but that as a performer, it was like, okay, what's the final challenge? It's to get up in front of a room full of strangers, and make them pay and make them feel like paying attention to you is a uh, is worth their time for forty five minutes to an hour, and you know it doesn't always work, but that's <laughs> that was. I wanted to see if I could do it. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, as I got older, I mean, that's why I stepped back from that, like the front guy thing, because I just, it was starting to kill me and I'm getting older, you know, and uh, and I was like, man, I just want to be in a band with a good singer mm. and I can hide in the back and 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 write ballads. <laughs> and so that's what I do. I write, I write really sad ballads and, and hope, the ba my band doesn't kill me for for writing so many sad ones and uh and i get to hide in the back and i fucking i love it i just love it you know with fontaine it was oh i was i love those guys so much but i got really tired of being in front and and with the delines i'm i'm always like i could i could do 300 nights a year with the delines because i'm just i'm just a guy in the back that plays a few notes and then then i'm done and i can you know read novels and drink beer yeah, I'll definitely say after after a bunch of years of driving around the world by myself, um, it was very it was relaxing to come back into band world after having yeah. done that. Like ah, now I can appreciate this. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Do you have a when? Do you have an ideal reader in mind when you're when you're writing your books? You have someone that you that you want to impress, or you want people to want to feel like you you nailed it. Uh, you know, when I was early, when I first started writing, I was in my early twenties. When I got when I when I kind of got on the on the um. Hold on a sec. The my keyboard player is playing a bunch of organ right now, <laughs> and I couldn't hear. Oops, we lost your connection. Ow. Sorry, I lost you out there again. But I got you back now. All right. Oh, so the question, um, when I was in my early 20s, I, I, I wrote for the, the guys I grew up with hoping that they would uh, read novels. So I wrote real simple, really intense novels uh, I thought anyway, because uh, I wanted guys that didn't read to read. Um, and now, now I don't do that so much. Um, you just want to connect with anybody. I, I don't think about. Uh, I want people that are hurting to to feel comfort in my books. Um, but other than that, I don't have an audience. You wrote a couple books uh, before you started publishing, right? Were you writing them for the drawer, or you uh, you, you wanted you want what was the story with those? I, I wrote from when I was uh, nineteen to thirty five, really, and didn't show anybody. So I think I wrote four or five novels in that time, and you know, a stack of stories, uh, uh, three feet tall, really. Uh, 
I just, I didn't have a lot of confidence and I, I didn't want anyone to beat up uh, my stories the way my band was getting beat up at the time. And, uh, and so I just, it was my thing. And I, I and I, like I said, I just had no confidence. And then, and then my band started doing better and I got a little more confidence. I got older and got more confident and just kind of hit a lucky streak where I, where I liked myself for a little bit, you know, and, and so, and that was when I showed somebody, uh, the motel life was the one I just finished and I showed someone that and they sold it. And, and then, you know, I started living a different way. Have you gone back and looked at any of that, that early material? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, man. I mean, only one, there's only one, you know, I wrote, I wrote like a Harlequin romance and I wrote a, I wrote some crazy ones, but I, I wrote one about a uh, used car salesman, um, uh, the, a family of used car salesmen, and that I love that one. But it's oops, you've gone, you've gone frozen again, unfortunately. Like a fancy place with a hot shot internet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there you are. Yeah, it's interesting to to to, to talk some to someone who's go, did did an apprenticeship uh, process like that, but all alone. Yeah, it was. I mean, I didn't mind it at all. You know, I showed it to a couple friends, but in general, I you know I I like the process and the groundwork of, of writing novels. Um, I really do, and I and it was my own thing. You know how it is when you're putting in a band a struggling band that not a lot of people like when you're young you know you're in bands that not a lot of people like and uh and if you're insecure uh and don't have a lot of confidence um you know writing's great because you you're, you're not bothering anybody your neighbors aren't pissed the guy living above you's not pissed your girlfriend's not pissed because you're playing the same song over and over uh you're just in a room by yourself uh living in a different world and and jesus i love that uh -huh. um got a question from from vanessa jean speckman hi vanessa um who wants to know how do you always find empathy in all your characters i i, I guess i interpret that to mean including with some of the the more distasteful characters that uh that come into and out of your your, your protagonist lives i mean every every kind of bad motherfucker I've met in my life, I guess, or like destructive person I've met in my life uh, has really good sides to him too. I think sometimes the, the, the sweetest people are the, can be the most cruel because they've had to get their sweet side pretty good to make up for their cruelty. Um, so I think it's all, it's all a mix. Um, people are a mix. Uh, and so I just think about that, you know, so many people are, are messed up and it's a result of pain and, um, um, and, and, and getting too beat up too young. Um, did I just think about it that way? If, but that's why I don't write about murderers really. And I won't write about rapists or, or pedophiles or any of that shit. Cause I don't want to be around it and I don't want to spend time on it. So I have empathy for just normal kind of like <laughs> bastards and uh, beat up people. I have empathy for that. Like, uh, I guess the, the hardest characters I've ever written would be uh, Jimmy in uh, Northline, who was m kind of a skinhead, but he was just a beat up kid that shit, life wasn't going his way and he got sidetracked. And, um, and uh, I don't think he was a horrible guy. He's just, he just took a wrong turn and, uh, he might, there's a chance he could grow out of it, but at least I could see why he did what he did. And that makes it okay for me to have empathy for him. If I can, if I can track track why they are what they are. That's the trick, right? Most people have justifications for what they do and they could explain why they're doing what they're doing. And you gotta, it depends. It just depends on how much time you want to spend in their head. Yeah. I mean, identifying yeah. with that. Oh yeah, and like the, the you know, the, sorry, Franz, I stole your, I took your car and your credit card, but I really had to because I had this emergency. And then you get wrapped up in the drama of, and you start feeling bad for them. And but they just took your car and put a big dent in it, and they, and they they happen to just find your credit card, but they had to. Uh, but they're your cousin, 
So, you know, it just gets layered and tricky. Uh, and, and people are like that. People are like that. I think we're almost at the end of, their, of, of our time, which makes me kind of want to bring it full circle um, uh, to the, the and, and ask you, how long has it been since you, since you painted a house? And, and do you miss that work at all? Man, I do. Uh, uh, I do know that it's been. Uh, I keep. I keep waiting for 2024 because that'll be when I. Uh oh. Oh, there you are again. 2024 you said no no 2000 yeah 2004 is when i quit painting and 2024 will be 20 years man so you know i fucking i see a, a guy in painting whites and i break out in a cold sweat <laughs> i want to go back to it i will but i you know it took me 10 years to sell my painting truck and it took me 10 years to sell my gear because i kept being scared to Go, that I that I didn't want to think that I wasn't going to have to go back, and now now I just now I just don't <laughs> I just don't want to go back, and now I'm scared shitless because I'm getting lazy. Uh -huh. Well, cool. Thank you, Willie. Thanks so much for everyone who came, and thanks for Chris and Powerhouse for putting this together. This was fantastic. Oh man, thanks for being so nice, and it's a, been a pleasure to meet you. And I love your book. I love your book, by the way, and I wish you all the luck with it. Oh, thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you so much. That, that was excellent. Real, real astute talk about writing fiction. Uh, thank you, Franz. Thank you, Willie. Thank you, everybody who asked questions on the chat. And uh, if you missed any of the event for any reason, we'll have it on YouTube. Hey, thanks a lot, Chris. See you. Thank you.